So we've been thinking about functions in these four different perspectives, right? We can think about them in written verbal descriptions. I can tell you what a function does. We can think of a function as being defined by a table of data. We can think of a function being defined as a graph. Um, and we can think of a function being defined using a formula, right? Um, but in all four of those different cases, a function describes uh, a relationship between two quantities. You know, and that typically, when one of those quantities changes, the other one changes uh, respectively as a result, right? And so you sort of think of a function, call it f, uh, as being like an input and output machine, right? where I can put an input some element of the domain of my function I can put into the function and then the function does whatever the function does and it spits out an output that we call f of x, right? That's a member of the range of this function. And so, you know, we, we give it an input, it gives me an output. Um, an example of this is, I don't know, um, the, the function that our author loves in this first chapter is the function that, where the crickets chirping can tell you the temperature. Right, Dolbert's principle or whatever, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and so if I think of that as being my function that I care about, right, then I'm putting in a cricket chirp rate into the function. Chirp rate, measured in chirps per minute or whatever. Um, and it spits out the other end, f of c, which is the outdoor temperature. in degrees Fahrenheit or something, right? And so it describes this relationship. Well, some relationships can also go the other way. Right? If I know how quickly the crickets are chirping, this function can tell me what the temperature is outside. But it might also be the case that if I know what temperature it is, I can have this same relationship tell me how quickly the crickets are chirping, right? But that's not necessarily the case for all functions. Not every function can be reversed in that way. Um, just as an abstract mathematical example, and this gave us some trouble in some of the algebra workshops, let's suppose I just take the function that has the expression, uh, the, uh, uh, the formula f of x equals, I don't know, x squared, right? Simple. And if I put the number five into this function, what output does it give me? 25. 25. If I were to put 25 back through this function backwards, what input could have given me 25? Five or negative five. Aha, right. So that's what I'm getting at, is that it might be the case for some functions that two different inputs can give me the same output. Right. f of x equals x squared is such a function. If I put 5 into this function, it gives me 25 as an output. But if I put negative 5 in, it also gives me 25 as an output. So if I try to create a reverse to this, if I put 25 back into the output uh, shoot of this and try and get something out the input, am I going to get a 5 or am I going to get a negative 5? Can I get both? And so the question is, if I were to tell you that this reverse is a function, what would you tell me? Not a very well posed question, but I'm going to kind of leave it like that. Suppose that I asserted that this thing, whatever, I'm just going to call it, not f, I'm going to call it uh, g instead. Suppose I were to tell you that this thing is a function, it takes as an input 25, and it gives me these outputs. Mm. What's wrong with that? I'm getting two outputs from the same input, and why can we not do that? It breaks the definition of a function, exactly, right. Um, so regardless of whether a hot dog is a sandwich, right, if we have a definition of what a sandwich is, then it gives us the ability to tell sandwiches from not sandwiches. We know what the definition of a function is. One input gives me only one output. And any machine which does not do that, which violates that rule, as this one does, one input, two outputs, this G cannot be a function. Yeah, exactly. If it went the other way, as, it, as we started with, right? If we just reverse this, f of x equals x squared, with the minus 5 and the plus 5 both feeding into the machine, giving me the same output, 
even though the inputs were different, that's still OK. Right? That works. Because if you tell me a number, I can tell you for sure what its square is. But the converse, if you ask me, give me a single number whose square is 25, there is not only one answer to that question. As long as 5 and negative 5 are both permissible in the domain of the function we chose. So here's a question. Would there be a way for me to change this function so that we can go both directions? What would be the only way to do it? We have to decide on one of these two. Let's decide. Let's, let's suppose that I choose only negatives. Let's suppose I don't care about positive 5. How can I do that? I can do that by just restricting the domain of f. Let's make the domain of f consist only of the non-positive real numbers. All right? So I'm going to make my new domain of my function minus infinity to r, or minus infinity to 0. If I do that, then we can't worry about 5, because 5 isn't even allowed to be an input to this function. Right? Only negative 5 is, and all the other negative uh, and 0 are real numbers. And so now, can I go backwards? If I put 25 backwards through this uh, machine, yeah, that's totally fine. Right? So if I restrict the domain on a function that doesn't let me go backwards, sometimes, I, sometimes that restricted function, we can go backwards. Right? Um, and in fact, that is exactly what the square root button on your calculator is. right? Um, the square root button on your calculator is the reverse of the square function, but th that button on your calculator has already made the decision that, in fact, it's only going to give you, if you press the square root of 25 on a calculator, what is it going to tell you? Positive. Positive, right. So the calculator has made the opposite decision on the domain of the squaring function that has a reverse function. I'm being very blunt about my, my language here because I'm going to make it precise in a minute. Um, but yeah, if we restrict the squaring function to only positive numbers, then we're OK, right? Because then we know that only positive 5 could have gone into this function in the first place. We don't have to worry about its opposite. And so when I reverse it, the square root of 25 is positive 5. So here's, let me put some language to all of this before we get started on the activities for today. <clears throat> Wipe off the screen here. So the two main concepts for today. The first one is the one that I've been talking about here. It's called the inverse of a function. Inverse of a function. So if I have a function, let's say its name is f, and I think of my outputs of my function as being y, and my inputs of my function as being x, then we'll say y is equal to f of x as we usually do. Right? F's job is to turn x's into y's. Well, if I take that same relationship, which is given to me by the f function, and I decide to just reverse the roles of the input and the output, trade spaces between x and y, then I get a new kind of relationship, if it exists, that instead of turning x's into y's, turns y's back into x's, and we'll get x equals So first, let me uh, address the specific example um, that, <clears throat> that, that you mentioned. Um, so in the example that we talked about before, if f of x is x squared, and f has as its domain just non-negative numbers, right, then what might the inverse of this function be? Well, it's what happens if we try to solve this equation that relates x and y together. Solve this equation for x. You know, make x the subject instead of make y the subject. How do I solve this equation for x? Take the square root on both sides. But when I take the square root on both sides, 
on the left side of my equation, I get the square root of y. But on the right side of the equation, I get the square root of x squared. And what have I been... That's not equal to x, actually. What I've been trying to beat into people's heads. It's... Absolute value, yes. Right, and so we're not done solving for x, basically, right? The, the, the short story. If, if I want to solve this for x now, get rid of those absolute values, then what happens to these vertical sticks? They disappear, but where do they go? They don't disappear, actually. They move. They move over in front of the square root sign in front of the other side of the equation to become a plus or a minus, right? So if I'm just solving this equation for x, the square root of an even power of a quantity always gives me an absolute value here because of the problem that we talked about with pluses and minuses, right? That when I take an even power, a plus and a minus are both going to become a plus, right? And so we lose the ability to tell the difference between positive 5 and negative 5 once we square them, right? That's what was happening in that machine. And so now at the end of the day, I get plus or minus the square root of y. But that's a problem because that ain't a function because of the plus or minus that's sitting there. It has two different y's for a given x. Right? Uh, sorry, two different x's for a given y. And that we can't have. But I restricted my domain. I restricted my x's so that they were only going to be non-negative. Right? I had to make that choice because once I make that choice, now I can take this plus or minus and say, well, we're only ever going to have the plus because all my x's are non-negative. And so we don't have to worry about it because I've restricted my domain. So what I'm going to do instead, then, is I'm just going to forget about that plus or minus. But my point is we can't forget about it from the beginning. We can only forget about it because we've decided ahead of time that the x's are only going to be non-negative. And so now, at the end of it, we can say x equals the square root of y. And so my inverse function, f inverse of y, is the square root of y. Right? So my original function is the squaring function. Its inverse function is the square root function. Does this always work? And the answer, as we've already seen, is no. Right? There are a lot of functions that we cannot reverse, because there will be multiple different inputs that give me the same output. Sometimes two different inputs give me the same output. Sometimes three different inputs give me the same output. Sometimes there are infinitely many different inputs that give me the same output. Those functions don't have inverses unless and until we can restrict their domain in a way that gives each output a unique input, as we do with the square root function when we uh, uh, limit the domain of the, of the square. So that's inverse. Um, and an inverse function should have the property that if I plug a value into f and then I plug that same output value back into the inverse of f, where should I get? I should get back to the very same value I started with. Right. I should get back to x. f of f inverse of x. f inverse of x needs to give me x back. And vice versa for f inverse of f of x. So that's kind of the algebraic definition of what it means for f inverse to be the inverse function, right? If I put x into one of those functions and then put the result into the other, the result should always give me the very same number. The inverse undoes what f does. That's all. And vice versa. That's a symmetric relationship. The inverse of the inverse function of f is f. If f is the inverse of g, then g is the inverse of f. Yeah, however you want to see that. But, and the reason that I wanted to end on that description is that feeding the output of one function into the input of another function is another construction that we call the composite, the composition of two functions. Um, and that's the topic of 1.6, and that's actually where we're going to start today. So we're going to be building towards these ideas about inverses throughout the course of today's class by starting with the question, what happens when I plug one function into another? That's the process of composition.